the 2010 decade started off exceptionally for Intel. Nobody could have predicted that Sandy Bridge would have produced the gains that we saw with it. And if you did, you might have thought that those gains would have continued throughout the next five or so years at least. Instead, what ended up happening was somewhere in the middle of the decade, around the 4,000, 6,000, and 7,000 series, there was serious stagnation beginning to happen for Intel's parts. Intel at the time was content with doing four core, eight thread i7s over and over, and had no competition at all from AMD, other than FX parts that were later dragged through a class action lawsuit. So the decade started off strong. And today, we're doing a revisit of Intel's parts made from about 2010 until about 2019 to look at how the company performed over the years, what its percent scaling was, and how the asymptotic curve starts to look. At what point does it start to flatline for Intel's performance advancements? That will carry us into the 10 series coming up very shortly. Before that, this video is brought to you by us and the Gamers Nexus Large Mod Mat. We just received a massive restock and we'll be shipping all back orders and new orders immediately. So if you've been waiting for one of our critically acclaimed anti-static PC building services, now is a great time to order. The mod mats protect your table during builds and include pinout diagrams that we use nearly daily for power testing. They also have grids with a silhouette to aid in tracking screws for your own component teardowns and use an anti-static material made by our factory that makes clean room parts to help protect sensitive electronics. Grab your GN mod mat on store.gamersnexus.net today and it'll ship immediately. Despite its marketing, the Intel 10 series CPUs actually look kind of promising. We can't really comment on it yet because we haven't tested it. And if we did, we'd still be under NDA for it. But as of filming, we don't have the parts physically in hand. So we'll hold our breath on it. But the biggest changes that Intel's making is it's increasing core count and it's keeping the price at least the same at a given level in the stack, where the 10700K and the 10900K, damned as their names may be, are in better positions than Intel was previously. So yes, Intel now has, as one of the commenters pointed out, achieved the feat of having something like half or more of its product portfolio in the core series being 14 nanometer silicon and refreshes at that. But uh, the company's trying to move forward. What we need to do is look back at the previous decade, 2600K, 2500K owners of those CPUs for a long time now from our other revisits, you know that you can feel proud about your purchases because those are some phenomenal parts, especially once you overclock them. They carry well into the 4000 and even 6000 series stock performance in some instances, but things did sort of taper out. And moving forward, what Intel really needs at this point in order to up its competition against AMD is going to be another one of those killer Sandy Bridge parts. We'll see if that's the 10 series. And even if it is, it does have Ryzen to compete with these days. But nonetheless, competition is in fact a good thing. It's more than just something people say. It is what pushes these companies to make better products and reduce the prices. So uh, today we're going to be talking about the relative pricing of Intel's old CPUs versus new and how there's been a price creep over the years, an increase that exceeds inflation. And we'll also be talking through the relative performance from CPU to CPU within and outside of given price brackets. So we've got a, a good amount of games. We're narrowing in on almost entirely Intel results on this. So don't be mad that you're not seeing a lot of AMD. The focus is a decade of Intel. We're telling the story of what has Intel's last 10 years, what have they looked like? How has it progressed? That's the focus. For perspective, we have included AMD parts and some of these charts, some of them have a few more than others, but we've got at least an AMD R5 3600 when talking about i5s, at least an AMD R7 3700X when talking about i7s, and sometimes more than that. So our focus, again, is Intel today. If you want to see AMD benchmarks, we have a brand new testing methodology getting deployed probably in tomorrow's video with tests from both vendors, and then we're going to be starting to roll out some new videos uh, using that methodology, so stay tuned for that. But let's get started with a decade of Intel in review. GTA 5 is a great game to start with for this specific benchmark, and that's because it's old enough to have been new when several of these CPUs were still coming out. Hard note here, our next chart looks at a new game because that's important for core utilization that's changed a lot over the years. We'll start with just a breakout chart highlighting the key i5 CPUs. So that'd be the 2500K, 3570K, 4690K, 6600K, 7600K, 8400 and the 9600K. First, we should point out how tightly packed some of these CPUs are. Ignoring overclock data, the top to bottom range is 49 FPS for the gap, or an improvement of 77% over a 10-year period. 
If we restrict that down to the 4690K, which launched in 2014, the stock improvement is about 43%. Those aren't great numbers and show exactly why everyone has almost wholesale stopped talking about i5 CPUs. The higher end CPUs have shown great gains, but i5 has become the dumping ground for Intel's filler part, and that's why it's lost the battle to AMD's R5 series. The decade started five years before GTA 5 came out, but the 2500K, plotting a 64 FPS average and lows that are actually sustainable, shows that it's still strong. Even five years after its launch, the 2500K is able to hold on at playable frame rates and frame times on new games. Well, new ish in this case. The 3570K came out in 2012 for $250 following the 2500K's $216 price with an uplift of 9.7%. As the generations went on, those improvements condensed. The 7600K only improved 6% over the 6600K, and that's the era we started telling our readers not to upgrade if they had the previous series part in their system already. We'll come back to GTA 5 in a second for i7 parts, but we need some context for actual i5 improvement over the years. For that, let's look at a more modern game. For Shadow of the Tomb Raider with just the i5 CPUs, we see a far greater scale than in GTA 5. This is obviously because of an increase in core utilization with newer titles, and is highlighted by the now larger gap of about 163% increase from the 2500K stock to the 9600K stock. That looks a lot better. The 2500K is still something of a beast for a decade old part, but it's not as impressive here as it was in an older title. The 3570K gained about 14%, the 4690K gained about 17%, over the 3570K, and the 6600K gained 21% over that. The 4690K overclock is found above the stock 6600K, and is exactly why that was around the time when we stopped recommending upgrades, again, for owners who had recent parts. That's still a massive jump for both, to be fair. The 8400 really piled it on, though, and gained 56% over the stock 6600K CPU. This isn't even the 8600K part, which we haven't retested recently. The key difference, of course, was the core count increase. The 9600K became boring again at 3.8% gained, unfortunately, but OC Headroom pushed it the rest of the way. Switching over to an i7 chart, barring the i9 since it's totally different in price class and also not an i7, we return to GTA momentarily. Remember that the 9700K is $380 to $400 retail, while the older i7 parts ranged from $317 to $350. We've also added the i7-930 Nehalem part in here, but it's older than our decade marker. Astute viewers will notice that the 2600K is about the same as the 2500K in performance, and even slightly lower. This was back when hyper-threading sometimes had more overhead than it had benefit, and so you'd occasionally see about a 1% gaming performance hit between i5 and i7 parts that were otherwise identical. That's why an i5 is enough for gaming came about, because it was not only accurate to say, but it was often technically the better purchase. The lack of differentiation between i5 and i7 parts faded away with time though. The top to bottom range, starting at the 2600K to 9700K stock, is 95% for 10 years, or 36% for six years at the 4790K. The i7 CPUs stagnated around the 6700 to 8700K era in older games like this, but the 8700K became an important CPU for newer games and for applications with more thread dependence. This was when Intel and AMD were rapidly releasing new parts one after the other, and it was a close battle where the 8700K was able to win back some of the applications that Intel had lost with the Ryzen launch. One thing's for damn sure though, nothing quite overclocked like the Sandy Bridge parts. That jump is colossal. At 26% improved over its own stock result, the 2600K remains one of the best CPUs that's come out in the last decade. We partially miss these days, but it also just means that both AMD and Intel are shipping parts closer to maximum performance. Before moving on, here's a chart of all the i5, i7, and i9 non-HEDT CPUs for GTA 5. The 9900K clearly chokes on the limitations of this game, providing no value over the 9700K or even an overclocked 9600K. More importantly, look at the 2500K versus the 2600K. They're about the same and some hyper-threading overhead is visible outside of test variants. The 4690K and 4790K have a clear delta at 6.8% improved on the i7. The 6600 and 6700Ks show similar at a 6.5% increase. Still, it's obvious why an i5 4690K was the best gaming buy at the time, and why the 6600K mostly followed. No one wanted to pay an extra $100 between board and CPU 
to gain 6% frame rate, especially with an easy i5OC. Time to move on. Here's the chart for Tomb Raider again, but for i7 CPUs. The previous and current decades bled together with the i7-930, which is actually a surprisingly strong performer in this game. But the 2600K is where we'll officially start the discussion. Stock 2600K to stock 9700K, the improvement is about 129% over 10 years. Not as much as in the i5 series, which saw a paradigm shift that increased the thread count, but still better than GTA 5's results. The 2600K overclock is another high scorer with a 31% increase, which you never hear of today. And that helps compound the difficulty of advancing CPUs. Intel has shrunk an OC headroom as a byproduct of increasing out-of-box frequencies closer to their limits, but still had generational slowdowns in the 6000 and 7000 eras. One a refresh of the other, and then again in the 9000 and 8000 era where we had a refresh of basically a refresh. The 8700K is interesting because its extra threads make it actually better in some applications, but the 9700K does make up for any deficit with increased frequency headroom. The 2600K stock to 4790K stock jump was 48%, skipping one generation, 3000, or 14% from the OC 2600K. 4790K to 6700K, which was the real jump, pushed 24% higher. The 7700K was 3.8% higher. Yikes. And the 8700K was 15% better than that. Here's the chart of all the desktop CPUs for Intel that we've tested lately, plus the 3700X. The 9900KS, 9900K, and 9700KOC are all reaching the upper bound of the GPU, and so we're starting to encounter a GPU bottleneck. In this particular game, we see the opposite of GTA. The 2500K and 2600K actually have a meaningful gap between them, about 32% higher on the i7, and that's thanks to higher core dependence with newer titles. This is great historical information on why everyone, including us, was completely content with recommending an i5 for gaming back around the Haswell and surrounding generations. These types of games didn't really exist yet, at least not very many of them did. Assassin's Creed is next. This is another series where core count really started to matter. The top to bottom range for i5 CPUs runs 125% from the 2500K at 51 FPS average to 114 FPS average. The i5 CPUs have another very clear division in the chart, just like Tomb Raider. There's a 39% climb from the 7600K to the 8400, which isn't even a K skew part, and that's a clear benefit of the core count increase. The 9600K posted smaller gains and smaller still if we had a fresh 8600K retested here, but overclocking headroom of the 9000 series allowed it some room to grow. The trouble, of course, is that this would eat into the performance growth for the next generation part if it remained on six cores and six threads, since Intel is about at its limits of frequency for this process. Fortunately for Intel, it has restructured the core count for the entire stack, so this stagnation should be at least temporarily resolved. We'll likely see another large jump in appropriate games. The gains are like this. 2500K to 3570K, we saw a 13% increase. 4690 to 6600K stock was a noteworthy 21%, but the 4690K OC gave us 24% and surpassed the stock 6600K. The 7600K gained a dismal 2.6% over the 6600K, showing stagnation, and the 8000 series temporarily resolved that. Here's the i7 chart. The 9700K really establishes a firm lead over Intel's previous 8700K despite a lower thread count. This is where modern games start to really work well on 8 cores, and the higher frequency and lower resource contention accomplishes the rest. The 2600K still does well at 58 FPS average, and our top to bottom gain is 140% stock to stock. The 2600K OC was insane once again, gaining significantly and encroaching on Intel's smothered child, the 5775C, that it wants you to forget about. The 4790K gained 46% over the 2600K, by skipping a generation, or 26% comparing the 4.8 GHz 4790K to the 4.7 GHz 2600K. The 6700K showed that the curve was slowing to an asymptotic plateau at 14.7% gained, then a measly 2% gain with the 7700K. The 8700K jumped back to 14%, then 23% for the 9700K. That's more of what we want to see, and what hopefully we'll see with the 10 series of Intel desktop CPUs, but 
That 7700K and the era surrounding it, well, that was a little bit rough. Here's the chart for everything. The interesting note is the i5-8400's performance over the 7700K, where it's even clearer that newer games than the 6600K started caring more about the extra cores. Four core, eight thread setups aren't always as good or better than the six core, six thread setups. It depends on the application. Some of that is thanks to consoles where the higher core count designs have advanced games to finally start leveraging them. And that's just a matter of testing games from different eras where that was already a change in place for the consoles. The 9900K, KS, and 9700K OC results are all bumping off the GPU bottleneck, so we can't really see the, the full top range of performance here. Civilization VI is next, which is more of a frequency happy test that doesn't care as much for cores. In this one, Intel's generational gains aren't as impressive as in the previous two games. It's more like GTA. We see a 30% reduction in the turn time requirement between the stock 9600K and stock 2500K, so that's 10 years to get you a 30% reduction in turn time required. But the stat math gets a bit funny here since we're now talking about reduction rather than an increase. If you converted this to scoring and sorted by highest, it'd be equivalent to about an 80% increase in performance. That's significantly below still the 120 to 140% marker we saw in more thread dependent titles and is more of what people think of when they picture Intel generational stagnation prior to the 8000 series. The 2500K to 3570K jump is just a 6.4% reduction. 3570K to 4690K is a more noteworthy 10% reduction. 6600K is faster by an additional 10.4% over the 4690K and then the 4690K OC leads that. The 7600K, a 6% reduction this time, and then the i5-8400 did nothing to fix that, and neither would the 8600K, just maybe to a less significant degree. Here's the full chart. The 2600K and 2500K did have a meaningful gap in this one, but the 3570K didn't move very much versus the previous i7. Other interesting notes are that the 9900K and KS illustrate the frequency being responsible for the top of chart gains as 14 nanometer hits the final limits with Intel TVB stretching 100 megahertz more sometimes than 10th gen, if you call it a gen, Intel is going to need new tricks after the 10 series to keep pushing further. F1 2018 is also a frequency happy application. In this one, we see an 88% gain from the 2500K to the i5-9600K. This is the type of game that created the feeling of stagnation as well. Unlike Tomb Raider and Assassin's Creed, here we're seeing limited gains of about 7% from 3570K to 4690K and just 10% from the 4690K to 6600K stock. That's without even considering overclocking. The 2600K at 4.7 gigahertz makes purchasers of Sandy Bridge no doubt feel smug or at least prideful in their choice. The i7 series outside of this one was similar overall to the i5 series with the 6700K only gaining about 7.5% performance over the 4790K and the 9900KS shows that there's still somehow room in our 300 FPS plus range to gain more frames with an overclock. This is the type of game where the 10 series probably won't look as good since it won't be able to leverage its thread increases as well, and will have to rely on the smaller 100-ish megahertz gains in boost. Hitman 2 with DX12 is an interesting one. Here we see the larger top to bottom range emerging between the 9600K stock and 2500K stock. It's about a 115% gain over the decade in i5 performance increases. For i7s, it's a gain from 66.6 .6 FPS average to 140 FPS average, or 111%. The 2600K gets another shout out for its overclock, nearly matching a many years later released 7600K and outdoing it in frame time consistency as well, thanks to the higher thread count. While the 6700K gets a nod for outdoing the 9600K stock CPU. The 9900KS demonstrates that the upper limit of this is the GPU at around 144 FPS average, so we don't have the test resolution to see scaling beyond a stock 9700K. This is also going to become a challenge for new CPUs, although we could synthetically create more CPU load by driving graphics options down, at some point you exit realism. It won't be until the 3000 series on video cards that this range will expand easily. Let's switch over to some production discussion. We'll begin our benchmarks with an all-core workload, just because it's an easier point to evaluate. There are fewer variables involved, and it's a purest look at CPU performance over the ages. Our Blender Monkey Head render starts us off. Before doing the full Intel chart, we're beginning with the look at only Intel CPUs that launched at $317 to $380. 
This is the old i7 class, before an i9 shuffled the entire stack and everyone's expectations with it. The $317 Intel i7-2600K completed this render in 65 minutes, with an overclock improving performance by 23%. We don't have a 3770K on here, so we'll skip one generation. The 4790K offered an improvement over the 2600K of about 34% from stock to stock, doing so at about a $30 premium. Overclocking headroom was more limited, as this was already a better version of the 4770K, and restricted us to 7.8% reduction in time required. The 5775C did worse than the 4790K, but was also a weird CPU that Intel forgot about and immediately buried with the 6700K. The 6700K reduced render time by 8.3% over the 4790K, and next, the 7700K reduced render time by 6.3%. At this point, Intel's generational gains had dropped from double digits between the Halem and Sandy Bridge and Sandy Bridge to Devil's Canyon, all the way down to low single digits on the 7700K. The 8700K changed this up thanks to pressure from AMD, bringing higher core counts down to the $380 part. The improvement versus the 7700K was a massive 30%, but you can't do that forever without killing the entire high end. The 9700K went in the opposite direction while costing roughly the same, about $380 to $400 retail, and suffered from a greedy choice to cut hyper-threading. This worsened the i7 generationally, and the 9700K only survived on its frequency. The 9900K isn't shown because its price is at $500, but for verbal reference, its performance has it about 20 minutes stock or 17 minutes overclocked. The GN logo render is next. The reason the 2600K has such a profound legacy is because of moments like this, where it can cut a 91 minute render time down to 68 minutes, or 25% reduction. There's a 38% render time reduction going from the stock 2600K to 4790K stock, then a hike to the 5775C, then a reduction to the 6700K. That drop is 11%, still in the double digits. The 6700K stock to 7700K stock is only a 6% reduction, while the overclocked 6700K actually outperforms the stock 7700K. Again, this is where Intel ran into its severe stagnation problems. More pronounced than even 4000 to 6000 in this instance, and it had to change. The 8700K got it back on track, and then the 9700K stagnated again. These are all CPUs that launched at about the same price, so Intel has run into the very real limitations of outpacing its architectural improvements with its product release cycle. And it was reluctant to, or unable to add more cores in at these $300 to $400 marks, with the result being a further widening of the void. The chart for all of the Blender results looks like this for the monkey heads. We've removed several of the 7000 and 9000 HEDT parts, since they're basically the same as the 10 series HEDT parts, for the most part, and the chart was getting too cluttered anyway. The 9900K is well positioned here relative to past and present CPUs, but we'd argue that the 8700K and the i7-2600K remain the two best value CPUs on this chart from this series. Of course, we're talking respective to the time that they came out. The 8700K was a real kick to the teeth for AMD's new Ryzen 7 1700 and put Intel back in a competitive position but that time was short-lived, as Intel pushed the CPU out before supply was even ready, before boards were even ready, and then had nothing left to work with. The 9900K was its next big move, but that also moved the price needle significantly higher than the rest of the stack, something which the newly announced 10 series DT parts are correcting. The i5 lineup at least impressed in one way previously. The 4690K brought nearly 2600K performance, except at a price reduction to $240. That was a meaningful change, and the 4690K was one of the best gaming parts at the time as well. It was a huge leap, about 18.5% from the 3570K previously here. Even the 3570K improved over the 2500K by 12% on its own. Let's move on to another application. 7-zip compression and decompression are next, starting with the latter. The decompression results show limited generational gains in some instances, like the 7.5% jump from the 2500K to the 3570K but there's an overall 119% increase from the 2500K stock to 9600K stock CPUs. Some results are less impressive, like the fact that it took Intel four numerical generations, not the same as actual generations, to get the i7-2600K levels of performance onto an i5-6600K part. The i7-6700K, though, gained about 44% over the 2600K in that same time. For i7 CPUs, the 9700K to 2600K void is a 141% increase, with the overclock producing some extra value at the top end. This is an interesting chart where, generationally, the differences are sometimes small from one to the next. 
the 6700K to 7700K in this instance, or the 2600K OC nearly equaling the 6700K five years later. As IPC increases and core count ticks up, we can see the gap widen. Intel needs to keep this trend into the 10 series of desktop CPUs in order to get an advancement into the double digits. And they might do it with the core count increase at similar prices to nine series CPUs. Still, the 3700X is great perspective for Intel's positioning, as is the 3600, a $200 part that outperforms most of Intel's lineup. For compression, the story is similar. The 2500K to 9600K improvement is 117% while the 2600K to 9700K improvement is 129%. The 9900K increases the ceiling, but it also increased the price. It's the 10 series where we should see another meaningful jump in all these charts at hopefully lower prices closer to the original cost of the chips. This last chart doesn't follow our theme fully. It's only six years of Intel CPUs, so we apologize for that, but it's still a good representation. We're looking at Adobe Premiere render time for a 1080p 60 H.264 video. This is for all of the CPUs that are relevant here. The 4690K finishes the render in nine and a half minutes, while the 6600K gets a marked 13% render time reduction. Keep in mind that the 5775C is an imaginary CPU that no one could buy. So the 6600K is basically the actual generational step. The 7600K improved 7%, which brought it to 4790K stock performance from a few years prior. On this chart, we're seeing a bigger impact from threads than we might have in years past, a change that Adobe made in recent versions. We see diminishing returns though with the 9900K, but just to show that the performance is not artificially limited, we've added the 10980XE on this chart to show us the real ceiling or floor, if you prefer, of performance, while the 3175X shows us that thread increases eventually fall off. A few AMD parts are also scattered for perspective if you want to pause it and look at those, but our focus is on 10 years of Intel. Not much changes on the 4K chart in the hierarchy. There's a harder line drawn at thread increases between the 9900K and 3950X, so this workload does torture the CPUs a bit harder, but the hierarchy is nearly identical other than a few shifts. Looking back at all this data then, it's always kind of eye-opening to see just how well Sandy Bridge scaled with overclocking. We've re-benchmarked Sandy Bridge annually for like three years now. There's a reason for it. A lot of people bought those CPUs and a lot of people really care about the numbers today because they're still good. But either way, the 10 series is going to be an important one to consider here. Intel is probably almost certainly at this point going to stay at the top in gaming charts. There becomes a difficulty for Intel where now the CPUs are getting fast enough and there hasn't been a new GPU generation that you're starting to really have to try to create a CPU bound load in games to the point where it might not be as realistic anymore. And we don't ever test 720p. The only time we did that was maybe one article for early IGPs and APUs, probably circa 2013 or something like that, maybe 2012. But we always stick with at least 1080p baseline, 1440p. Uh, and for the most part, a lot of games are obviously GPU bound. So yes, you can create a bottleneck, but there's a reasonable level. Given Sandy Bridge's phenomenal positioning in the market, it's hard to believe that Intel will start this decade with the same position that Sandy Bridge did. If we look at AMD right now, it seems like perhaps their 3000 series parts are about where that was. Ryzen 1, like the 1700, good part, it wasn't really competitive head to head in gaming just yet. It was one of those, well, it does well enough. And if you want the threads for other tasks like production workloads, then go for it. But otherwise, if you just want a game, keep buying Intel at the top end. That started changing when Intel's top end serious competitors got to $400 and $500. So Ryzen 1000 is probably comparable to Nehalem. And Ryzen 2 or 3000 might be the Sandy Bridge analog. So whether Intel's 10 series can achieve the same level of status as Sandy Bridge, that remains to be seen. Obviously, we'll be testing that shortly in reviews coming up sometime in the future in May. So uh, keep an eye on that. But that's your decade in review. Certainly, if it hadn't been already known, Intel had a very strong start to the decade. It flatlined in the center with 4,000, 6,000, 7,000, 5,000 doesn't really count. Intel buried that with 6,000 immediately. That was the true successor in desktop, but 5,000 was very good for the things it was good at. Uh, it's unfortunate it got buried. And then later on, 8,000, 9,000, but particularly 8,000, Intel started to wake up again 
So now 10 series is where we're going to see, okay, have they actually fully woken up or does Intel still need to hit some kind of silicon process advance to get back into gear? Check back for all that. Subscribe for more as always. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net to grab one of our large mod mats. We've just restocked them. We were out of stock for a long time due to a mix of human malware and uh, other shipping logistics challenges surrounding that. But they're back now. So visit the store if you want to pick one up or go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. It helps out there as well. We'll see you all next time.